Okay, so here we go. Um, obviously, why we're wanting to, to do this and, and uh, what's happening in, in Alberta is, is going to be very, very different than other parts of the country, but the, the commonality about uh, food security and COVID, like I mentioned, is, is pretty consistent across the country. Um, also, just a bit about us that, um, if you're not familiar, uh, Help Seeker is a B Corp social enterprise that focuses on scaling um, innovation uh, around complex social issues. So if you're wondering why we're talking about food security today and domestic violence next time, it's because we, we straddle all of these issues. And again, we, we see them as interconnected. Um, and the way we, we work in that space is through technology development and um, also community uh, development strategy work as well so that we can actually use the data and the technology in ways to transform our, our responses to these issues. So just a little bit about us if you don't know, and I'm, I think most of you do, but if you, if you don't know much, then this is a one pager and uh, our .co, helpseeker.co is where you can check out what else we're up to because I think we're it says there were in 100 communities, but we're actually in a 200, I, I found out yesterday, so I got to update that. Um, so a couple of notes as well that there's, there's lots going on across the country as a result of, of this uh, challenge posed by COVID. So if you haven't been keeping track of, of some of these macro trends, I thought I'd, I'd just contextualize the conversation today with, uh, with a bit about what's happening nationwide. So what we are hearing from, from food banks across the country is that usage is up and 20% seems to be the, the average. Yet these, uh, there's challenges reported around the av availability of volunteers in particular to, to pitch in uh, uh, reductions in staffing, um, food drives and the fundraising events that are impacting the entire charitable uh, nonprofit sector are impacting food banks as well. So amidst increasing demand, you have constraints on your ability to serve. And then uh, just straight up food shortages as well, um, in some of them reporting that on average 10 to 14 days of, of food is left in, in stock. That's not always the case, and, and, you'll, and you'll hear about some strategies to overcome some of these challenges, but as a whole, this has been what, what we've heard uh, report it. And that's because food banks are part of a broader uh, food ecosystem and that's impacted by, by COVID in, in some really significant ways. Uh, number one, of course, the purchasing power of us as consumers and especially those that are vulnerable um, are going to be dim diminished significantly. So if we have job losses, if we have, if we're not, not able to, to work as much because we got to take care of kids and like I do uh, running around in the in the background right now that's going to be impacting our ability to afford food and uh, obviously that's that's something that's happening across the um, across demographics food production as well as being impacted so uh, there's 10 to 14 uh, percent of farms that may shut down and you might not think that's a big deal but we have concentrated the meat processing in, in very few um, farms. And so if one of those goes down, there's going to be a significant impact. And we're already hearing about some concerns around beef, for instance, and then vegetables. So the financial losses that are that are being borne by farmers uh, that, that are primarily um, selling their their ware, their vegetable ware to restaurants and with restaurants being shut down, that's impacting farmers' ability to, to stay in business as well. So there's ramifications on, on that side of, of the food ecosystem that we want to keep in, in mind as well. When we looked at our, our data nationally, like, like I said, um, we obviously have tons of tons and tons of um, needs that are being reported across, uh, across the, the country. And when we honed in on, on basic needs, you can see there that it's, it's basically at the same level as housing and homelessness. There's only a, you know, a very slight uh, variation there. So this is just overall uh, what people are looking at when they're searching for assistance. And so um, definitely within the, the top you know, I would say the top two. And as I mentioned before, during the first uh, two weeks of COVID, it was actually number one. So um, it's interesting, the education and training and were, 
we're looking further into that, it, it's, it seems to be to do with um, kind of reskilling, but also people moving virtually and, and wanting to get access to some additional education and, and training. So that's, that's interesting. Um, we also had uh, wanted to look at what the ecosystem looks like uh, that is providing a food services across Canada. And these are the, the uh, available programs or listings in, in Help Seeker that are, have some kind of a food service. So um, I know we're going to be chatting with food banks in particular. It's a note to say that the, the food ecosystem and some of you on the call today might be in a program or organization that um, is providing food service, even though you might not be a you know, food specific or food only organization. So it's, it's just a note that our, um, our kind of uh, uh, social safety net includes a, a whole bunch of other organizations that are providing meal services, that are doing home delivery of, of packaged meals, et cetera, that, that are part of, of this effort. So across all of those, we saw food interactions up 264% in the last 30 days when we compare that to February. And we just picked on the last 30 days because that's the most recent. And then we said, let's look at February's um, numbers because we wanted to compare it to something before uh, COVID really hit. And you can see there that it's, it's quite significant. It's actually when we looked at mental health or addictions data, um, it's pretty uh, pretty much on par with those increases as well, and a little bit higher than domestic violence, which is about 170% up. So food practices during COVID, and we did a quick scan internationally to see what's happening um, and how people are responding to the increased demand. And again, I don't wanna uh, take away from all the uh, great um, perspective from the presenters. This is just a, a quick summary for what we are seeing, um, you know, globally and uh, in terms of responses. So people are going after increasing donations. So lots of lots of efforts are restaurants donating their spare foods that would otherwise go to waste. So lots of that, you know, repurposing of, of food supply for um, food banks, the delivery of food. Uh, from the food banks as well, especially to seniors and other uh, immune compromised populations. The increasing uh, move towards takeout and delivery services and partnerships for vulnerable groups, like I mentioned before, also partnerships to, for healthcare workers. So uh, being able to support those that are on the front lines at the medical level as well. Financial support, and we can see uh, packages coming from the feds as well as some provinces to organizations like the food bank that's certainly happening in, in Alberta, as well as uh, from the federal um, standpoint, recognizing that there's an increase in demand. Uh, mobile distribution, so having pickup sites, for instance, some schools have become pickup sites for food for um, some of their, their families that, that they've recognized as being uh, vulnerable through wellness checks, for instance. And then food banks becoming more and more, and I know this, this is a function that they've always played, um, maybe we haven't recognized this as such, but being system navigators for, um, for folks to other services as well. So because the food is such an essential need and, and that's sometimes one of the really, really good indicators of, of need in the vulnerable population at large, those um, services becoming a navigation point to other supports at the community level. And then some of the basic stuff that you can expect across the board that we've had to uh, adapt um, our services with additional hygiene precautions and um, the way that volunteers work and staff work to maintain social distancing as well. Um, and I know Steve's going to speak to this as well, but the way that we're serving um, meals and um, kind of the food uh, soup kitchen type services have, have started to move away from the group setting and buffet style into the takeaway bag meals as, as well. So that's at writ large what, what's being reported as, um, as an approach um, across the board, but of course, it's it's always more interesting to hear from folks that are doing the the work and innovation on the ground. So, I'm going to pass it over to Rod now, and uh, yeah, take it away, and uh, I'll I'll change the slides for you, Rod. So just uh, prompt me when when you need me to do that. Thanks, Alina. 
And I am really eager to be hearing from, uh, from James, from Steve, and also from others as the questions are being asked. So that's, that's what I'm in this for, is to be able to share with each other, to be learning from one another. So grateful for this opportunity. Also really grateful for Help Speakers. You talked about the interconnectedness, the link of all the different issues and and it really is important for us to acknowledge that no one service runs on its own it's it's all the linkages of the different things that we do all the partnerships and linkages of the different um players in community and how we need to be working together which is highlighted during a time like covid so I'll, give, I'll start with just giving a bit of a context about Abbotsford and this incredible community that I get to be a part of. So Abbotsford ha is a community with about 150,000 uh, population. We are the 23rd largest uh, population in Canada. Uh, outside of Metro Toronto and Metro Vancouver, we have the largest population of visible minority in Canada. So have a beautiful mix as far as our population that way. Uh, most prominently about 24% of our population comes from the Punjab region of India. Um, and one of the distinctions about Abbotsford is that it earns the highest dollars per acre uh, in, in agricultural land in the country. So that's even more than, let's say, the Niagara region or the North Okanagan region. Um, Abbotsford is the largest city by area in BC, and it's about 375 square kilometers. So it's, it's large. Much of that is within the agricultural land reserve. Uh, some of our, the names known, we're known by is we are the city in the country. And also we are the raspberry capital of Canada. So that's, that's a, a little bit of what we're known by. Um, another thing that, that I'm, I'm really proud of is that historically, and we've really worked at this, in Abbotsford, we do things together. So it's never a case of any one organization doing things alone and kind of building our territory and, and trying to do things on our own, but we've always done things together. So for, for decades around food security issues, Salvation Army and Cyrus Center and um, Mennonite Central Committee and, and Archways Food Bank and Christmas Bureau, we've, we've worked together around the food security issues. And then over time, um, the response around food security, five and two ministries and local churches and the Abbotsford School District and the, and the Indo-Canadian Business Association have come together into that to address the food security issues. And then more recently, um, as led by the city of Abbotsford, and, and I'm going to do a shout out here to, to specifically to Councillor Ross Stevens and, and Dina K. Bino, um, have, have led the Homelessness Action Advisory Committee, and then specifically the Abbotsford Homelessness Prevention and Response System Network um, to do a very systematic and concerted approach for how we address um, the food security uh, response that we have as a community. And, and there are partners like the Fraser Valley Food and Farm Collective and the Rail District that are coming up with innovative approaches to how we do this. So in Abbotsford, we do things as partners and that really changes the way we can approach things. Um, with that as the context and with that as the foundation, I'll just talk a little bit about Archway and the Archway Food Bank. So Archway is a nonprofit organization and we're a multi-service organization. Uh, we run about 90 different programs and services, um, and we provide services anywhere from babies to seniors, so all, all ages. And anything from women fleeing abusive relationships to 
youth who are trying to stay out of gangs. So uh, people in every circumstance of life. We uh, serve new immigrants and we also serve persons with developmental disabilities. So um, everyone to be able to know that they belong in community. Um, our mission is fostering community well-being and social justice through uh, leadership. And our vision is justice, opportunities, and equitable access for all. If, if I were to boil it down, I would say that we are about acknowledging that everybody has voice. But in community, not everyone necessarily acknowledges that voice. And so we're about ensuring that everyone's voice has an opportunity to be heard. Um, Archway Food Bank is one of those 90 programs that, that we have an opportunity to um, run in community. And our premise for food bank is that it's is the concept that it's more than a food bank. So it's it's more than being able to provide food. It's about dignity and it's about respect. And food bank, um, the individuals who come in, we we call guests. Um, so that's that's a little bit of the concept for us, uh, for the individuals who we have opportunity to to um, provide provide food security for. Um, with, with our food bank, for example, quite early on, an individual identified that it was really tough to, to eat because of a pain and in, in, in the mouth, in the teeth. And so one of the things that, that uh, Dave Murray, our, our manager, said is, okay, how can we get dental services as part of our food bank? And so he pulled in dentists and, and dental technicians, and, and now we have three dental chairs and all of the services that come along with that as part of the free services of our food bank. Um, we also now have summer camps, and that's through the partnership of, of churches and of different groups in the community who offer, offer that opportunity for families who are a part of the food bank. We have something called Starfish uh, Pack Programs. And uh, Starfish is, it was again, an acknowledgement originally that there were kids who are receiving hot meals during the week in school, but then throughout the weekend, uh, go through the entire weekend without any food. And so Starfish Pack is an opportunity discreetly to go home with two suppers, two lunches, and two breakfasts so that kids don't have to go without food during the weekend. And what started out as six kids um, has now grown to be 35 schools participating, Rotary Club, uh, a number of churches, grocery stores, and then it's throughout a number of different communities throughout BC and expanded beyond that um, of uh, different, a lot of different groups participating in the Starfish Pack program. Food Bank is also fresh food recovery and um, it is now expanded to 11 different satellites so that it's not individuals having to come to our food bank but it's again through partnership of incredible uh, community organizations and incredible churches who have outreach to their communities um, where we would provide uh, the food either through hampers or pantry um, and it's it's the outreach of those in those groups who provide the food to their communities. And Food Bank is also Everest. And Everest is the concept of identifying individuals so that rather than becoming another generation of Food Bank users would be, how can we work with the community and wrap around services so that there's employment opportunities and so that there's 
other kinds of wraparound supports so that there are ways for this particular family uh, to someday be no longer a food, food bank user and to create other opportunities so that, yeah, there's a different kind of set of goals that this individual sets for themselves to have a different kind of future. So that's, that's a little bit of context for the food bank. And then COVID-19. So um, if we could go to that slide then. Um, since COVID-19, uh, there has been what Alina, you referred to, a 20% increase in terms of the demand for uh, food uh, with the food bank. We did have about 3,000 uh, guests who would come into the food bank, and that has increased to about 3,600 who have uh, been accessing the food bank. And that's not including above and beyond that would be also with the satellites. And then also along above and beyond that as well would be, for example, with the school district and the starfish program. That's increased from about 300 to 500 uh, packs that were just in this week, uh, 500 packs that uh, the team and the Rotary Club and a number of different churches put together in order to ensure that there's food for um, kids in the community. So the, the demand has been growing uh, in light of people who have lost their jobs, in light of incredible number of growth in terms of uh, especially kids, yeah, families with kids who have needed uh, more support in food insecurity. And then Alina, over to the next slide. Thank you. COVID has um, changed the rules in terms of how we play, but certainly hasn't changed the underlying values, which is still the same that food has to remain accessible. Um, so there has to be stability of how uh, food, food security has to be there. So yeah, that issue of accessibility and that issue of availability of food. Therefore, how do we modify the way we provide services? How do we innovate in order to make sure that uh, food is available. So it was never a question to us of, do we close down in light of COVID? The question is, how do we, how do we modify? How do we innovate in order to make sure that there is food security for individuals who need to have food available? And so for our team, it was things like, people can't come in and choose the food that um, that that's available for them because of the social distancing reality and because of the safety type of factors. And so the modification is a walkthrough and a drive-through um, system of being able to, to make that kind of a shift. And then we are in beautiful rainy BC. So uh, we know that uh, the weather is going to be shifting, so we make umbrellas available uh, in the social distancing outside. Uh, so we make those kinds of changes. But it is that kind of thing. Um, also, in terms of um, the satellites and the, the food hubs that we have here, we, we've always had... Um, a community approach and a systems approach to doing things even before COVID hit. So when COVID hit, I just want to, to say that having had this, a system where we had partnerships already and where we had strong community approaches, the reality of the pandemic coming, um, 
the partnerships already existing made it possible for us to um, do the satellites and to have a strong system already existing. And so that was incredible to be able to, to do that. Um, and then because of the incredible kind of generosity of community, um, including funders who just jumped on board. Uh, we had our Abbotsford Community Foundation, and then we had United Way, we had uh, Van City and Vancouver Foundation, um, and uh, come with incredible supports. We were able to expand our satellites and add additional community hubs to new locations where we didn't have existing hubs existing already um, so that we could get the food out to new locations um, and make it available to socially isolated locations where it didn't previously exist. Um, so that's the kind of responses that we were able to do um, through the kinds of partnerships and through the kinds of collaborations that happened. Another thing that we were able to do is delivering of meals. So for socially isolated seniors, because we have um, a Meals on Wheels program, um, we were able to uh, use an existing opportunity and then deliver to even more seniors. Uh, uh, because we had existing vehicles, uh, and additional vehicles, we were able to take to um, more people into the community uh, because we were getting more calls from more seniors. Uh, that there, we saw an increase in that as well. So we were able to to provide more meals to seniors, more hampers, uh, as well as hot meals to seniors who were socially isolated as a result of of uh, of the pandemic. Another piece that I wanted to, to identify is that uh, we do have here in Abbotsford a system of like a, an approach of abundance as opposed to a scarcity mentality. So for any of the partners, our mindset isn't one of if one of the partners has something is take it for ourselves first, and then whatever leftover we might have, then let's share it with the other partners. But we would have the opposite kind of approach. And it, it takes a bit of discipline to do that, but um, we've been deliberate with each other and it's a trust kind of mechanism, but to, to call the other partners and say, hey, there's fresh food that has arrived, um, call up Salvation Army and call up the churches and say, um, there's, we've, we've got this, come and um, it's available, come and, come and um, access what's available uh, for you. And, and that happens across the partnership to all of us. Um, we received a grant a few years back with our satellites. And one of the things that we made sure with our satellites is that there was a commercial freezer, a commercial fridge available to all of the different satellites so that there could be fresh food made available to the different locations. Um, and so whenever there's fresh food available, it's not only in our one location, but it'll be to the various satellites. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we do here during COVID as well. I'll leave it at that and um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Raj. Um, and, and then it's, uh, it's on to James from Calgary Food Bank. So go for it, James. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Rod. Um, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, I haven't, I've got a whole bunch of pieces of paper in front of me here. And as we, we talk and we listen and, and going from some of the questions that we've had, um, I, I think it's quite interesting 
the conversation around food, what I'd like to highlight in my few minutes here is that during a pandemic, it, it actually laid bare the fact that Canada as a whole has no food policy as it relates to the needs of our community that is either not driven by uh, industry um, or driven by uh, sectors that are looking to either seek a profit or to reward themselves for some particular action. Um, I, I think the COVID has really brought through, um, as has other situations, you can look at fires, you can look at floods, uh, you can go back to SARS. And the experience that I would offer to everybody is to bring some of your knowledge of the past forward. Um, whenever we come into a pandemic, for some reason, everybody turns to food and everybody becomes a food security expert. So in Alberta, there are no less than two charity organizations in the past week who have flipped from being amateur sport organizations to being food banks. And so it's quite interesting to watch as the experts in food security are pushed back to being, oh, isn't it nice that you do this, but if you just get out of the way and, and let us who have never done this before pretend to be experts, that would be really, really great. And, and I think, again, that highlights that in a pandemic in an emergency management situation, food is never part of the question. Uh, everyone expects somebody else to have brought the food. And yet, all of a sudden, when people realize that food's not there, it starts a policy discussion that is being had during the most inopportune moment in time. Um, the analogy I use, uh, my grandfather was a firefighter. Uh, way back in the 1940s, and he was given a helmet, boots, and a jacket. Now, how they fought fires and how they addressed fires has changed. We've changed building codes. We have changed the materials that we use to build things. We have changed fire suppression systems. Uh, we have changed the chemicals that we use to, ch to do fires. So different fires have different types of uh, strategies around how you will do them. We try not to light fires in the first place. You know, don't put your oily rags in a basket in your garage type thing. Uh, but what has not changed in the last 80 years or even thousands of years is fire itself. Fire has not changed. But somehow during what we have these pandemics happen, um, and speaking more recently, public policy has not caught up to that. So this is akin to having your neighbor's fire, having your neighbor's house light on fire for some reason, and then having a bunch of government people come to you and say, if you could just prove to us that you can put out fires, we will actually allow you to apply for funding to develop a system that will stop this fire at a particular time. We don't ask our emergency responders to roll up in an ambulance that has nothing inside it. We don't ask our fire responders to roll up to a fire and then ask, ooh, somebody wants to get the water or should we, should we you know, do something else? Or maybe we should get like a fire retardant suit or something. Let's apply for a grant. So it, it, it's fun to listen to, and I would also offer the failure of public policy to assist during this time. So when pandemics happen, observation, it's a lot of organizations suddenly have to come to the forefront. And typically those organizations are not for profit and charities in our community already. And they're already fighting a fire. But somehow the policymakers have decided that now is the time that they need to ask more questions. So you will end up in, and I don't know about everybody else, you end up in more meetings where you have to justify your existence. Your history has nothing to do with it. Uh, no matter what you have done previously, what awards you've received, received, how you've done things, demonstrations, all that kind of stuff mean nothing because you're now in a group of people who would like to find out more about why do you think people need food? Or they will ask you questions about, have you ever considered feeding people during this period of time? And that really takes away from the effectiveness of the food security conversation, but also the, the pieces that we've had so far, the successes that we've had. 
Um, and that, when we look at the pandemic, I, I think is a challenge that everybody has to start to look at. We need to look at food security very specifically. We need to look at public policy around food that does not engage food industry as the defining pieces. We need to look at not profit taking during pandemics. And pretzels are not food. So one of the things that we've noticed from people when we talk about food is they're more than willing to give you snack foods. I can't believe you wouldn't accept this 50 pallet load of potato chips. These are potatoes, they're good for you. And we're like, what? Can I just give them back? Why don't you just give them to your staff? Have your staff take them home and eat potato chips for the next four months. Uh, this is not food security in any particular way. But unfortunately, there are no experts in the government that during the times when we're not in a pandemic actually apply themselves to the situation. So they rely on food banks, they rely on food services to suddenly bail them out. But again, across Canada now, we've seen, we've seen the government of Canada announce money to food banks three times. We, in the province of Alberta, we've seen no less than five announcements of money to food banks. And yet zero money has turned up at food banks and food agencies yet. So there's a lot of conversation. And during that time, we still have to feed people. We have to feed people who are isolated. We have to feed individuals who are vulnerable. We have to work with our partner agencies to try and address the situation that we were never engaged in the planning of in the first place, but are actually expected to do all the work now. So there's an analogy of, well, Rome burns. Um, I'm not gonna say it moistly, but that's one of the things I'm gonna go. Um, things about the Calgary Food Bank. Uh, we can all read websites. I would encourage everybody to check out your local food bank or something like that. But the slide that you can see on the screen, oh, sorry, thank you. What I offer is on the slide, and we'll share this around as well, just a snapshot of what COVID is. So for the Calgary Food Bank, we started seeing COVID about the middle of February. This is when we started seeing spikes in our data and we started to say, what's going on here? Something's weird. And we started listening to some of the, the jungle telegraph as you, as you would. Um, so on the screen in front of you right now, the dark lines are what we're actually seeing and the dotted lines are the five-year averages. Now, some of you may not be aware, but Alberta's been in a bit of a slump in the last little while. Something about natural resources being landlocked um, or the price of them tanking. So there's a bit of an issue in there as well. So when we look at this information for the Calgary Food Bank and for Alberta, this is actually not much new. Sure, there's some increases, but we were already at peak need within our community for community services and food just being one of them. So when we look at the lives affected by the Calgary Food Bank, it goes up and down a lot uh, because we're looking at a very close day by day blow. So weekends will be closer to zero type thing. But what you can see in the trend, if you sort of squint your eyes and look at it, it's relatively a flat line, maybe going up a little bit. So when we look at the hampers that we do, now a hamper in our case is seven days of food, Canada's food guide. To make things work, we shortened it to five days because you couldn't have people taking that much food with them. In, an, in a COVID situation, we just found that people could not take that much food. So we shrunk our hamper a bit in the short term. But again, if you squint your eyes when you're looking at the red, the hampers, we're actually above or right now below a five-year trend. So we're serving individuals, and I'll come to some of the reasons behind it in a second. We're serving individuals, yes, but a 1% increase for the Calgary Food Bank is literally thousands of people. So it kind of looks weird. Oh, you're only up 1%. Okay, well, if I had 10 bucks and you gave me a dollar, I'd be up 10%. That looks great. But in the case of large cities and the demands of urbanization, 1% is not a dollar, it's thousands of dollars. So we also have to talk about that when we look at what the impact is of the food demand in a particular city. Now the other line is a calls answered. So we take about 70,000 phone calls a year to the Calgary Food Bank and they're all related around food. Um, but it's also part of that first call of, I don't know what to do, but I know my fridge is empty. 
and you can see in the green line that relatively speaking, it is up to a greater extent than the lives affected and the hampers. And the reason that the number of calls we're taking is up, if we can flip to the next slide, is because of people who have never been engaged in the food bank before. During a pandemic, individuals with fixed income have seen relatively little change. My social services supports whatever they are in the province brand around Canada and in Alberta, it's AISH or Service Alberta. Um, if I'm a senior and I'm on a fixed income because I've got either a pension or I've got CPP or OAS, those haven't changed. They still have the same amount of money they had before. And in fact, we probably have a group of people in Canada who are more resilient to what's happening in COVID because they didn't have to adapt. They were already living in a vulnerable situation that was being poorly addressed by public policy. But what we see now in the slide in front is a 19% increase overall in the last couple of weeks. And last week alone, a 29% increase in new clients. These are individuals and families who are now stuck at home, have no employment because they got laid off, and don't know what to do because emergency packages and EI, it's great if you want to give somebody EI, the checks finally started rolling this week. We're eight weeks into this now. Eight weeks. And most likely you've been out of work for four. So people are already at their wits end, but you can give them a check, but what do they do with it? Do they pay their rent first? Because nobody's getting a rental deal. Do they pay their utilities? Do they pay their internet? So again, food becomes that piece that we don't talk about. And the information that we're providing is that this needs to be a policy issue where we need to look at actual experts, food security experts. And food banks are food security experts, but the problem there is that food banks should be closed. So as, as strange as it sounds, um, the Calgary Food Bank, we, the one that I play with, is that we want to close the Calgary Food Bank because there isn't a need for food. Food is a symptom of something else going wrong in our lives. So let's close a food bank, and that would be a great social experiment. Um, but we need to do it in a way that recognizes the root cause. The root cause being an income insecurity, no, no access to the resources that are necessary to thrive. And we need to do that in a way that recognizes that we can make changes in the lives through public policy or through connections. So when we talk about Calgary affectionately turning into, and most food banks in Canada did this, we just turned to a drive through model. So how do you take an organization that has over 4,000 volunteers and just overnight change it to having two meters distance between everybody and a system where you need to sort through food that's donated to you because you can't give somebody four kilograms of sauerkraut and say, here's your vegetables for a week. You need to have systems in place. So modifying those systems for social distance, but not violating public health. The number of times that we heard during the beginning of COVID, oh, just get some people together and sort the food. How? Isn't that violating public health? And strangely, in the province of Alberta, food banks were not considered essential services until a month ago. So we've gone through SARS, we've gone through uh, fires and floods in Calgary and Alberta. In fact, Fort McMurray's underwater again. Uh, and yet food banks were not an essential service, which meant that when you said you couldn't have 250 people gathering, in the case of the major cities, you couldn't open your food bank because you needed that many people to function. And when they squished it to 50 people can't gather, now there's an even bigger problem because it takes 70 people to actually turn on some of the larger food banks. So again, public policy failing to recognize what the role of food is and yet then phoning and saying, well, why haven't you done anything about this? So when we look at what's going on at the Calgary Food Bank, yes, we changed. That affectionately known as, and for those of you who have never met me, I'm a bit of a crackpot sometimes. I, affectionately, it's the world's largest drive through food bank. That's what we had to create. And it had to be a touchless food bank because we had to have the physical isolation that was going with it. 
and we couldn't violate certain things. So early on, we found out that food containers could hold the virus for up to 48 hours. But we had a whole bunch of people in the public eye and otherwise saying, oh, just give people food. Okay, so now we've got all this extra food handling going on, which in theory could actually become a transmission source of the COVID virus. And everyone's going, oh, just give out food quickly. And we're like, no, it has to sit for 48 hours. So from the point of donation, we now have to let it sit for 48 hours before we can figure out what we have and put it into some kind of fraction. As, as Rod said, you can't just come and pick right now. You have to put it into a package that can be distributed, but then it has to sit for 48 hours because you've touched it again. And you can't, if you go to give it to somebody, you can't, hey, how you doing? Here's the hug, here's the food. You, you have to continue with that isolation. But apparently the community was willing to sacrifice the health and well-being of vulnerable individuals just because they thought it would be great to quickly give out food. Public health rules have to come through. The other one about people demanding certain things happen is we had a whole bunch of people that wanted to volunteer until you asked them to do a particular job and then they didn't want to do it because it wasn't sexy. And so you said, well, we need you to do this. So I don't want to do that. Well, why not? Well, because I want to volunteer. But then you also had the issue of volunteers being told to do things that potentially violated a client's privacy. I want you to take this and take it over there to that person and give it to them. Okay, let's include the stranger factor. So now I've got a food bank and I'm just gonna take somebody off the street and hand them a bunch of food. I don't know anything about this person, but I'm gonna hand them food and they're gonna take it and deliver it to another complete stranger, i.e. a guest, a client. And no one thinks that the safety of these two individuals is important because, well, you're just a food bank or you're just a not-for-profit. You wouldn't understand this. Why don't you guys do it? Just make it like Uber, you can do that. Well, in the case of Uber or Skip the Dishes, other than the predatory rates that wreck businesses, there's a contractual obligation. We don't have that in the not-for-profit world or in the charitable world. We work on faith and trust, but we also don't wanna put people at risk during this difficult time. So there's gotta be some pushback, but there also has to be some conversations publicly before anything else happens. Everybody is a food security expert, as I said. And that is one of the most challenging things that we're facing during this pandemic is because everybody is suddenly out saying, I know what to do. And no one is talking to the organizations that actually do this all the time. And that creates a problem. At this point, all people are vulnerable. And the organizations such as we have here today and many of those listening, we're already dealing with vulnerable individuals because of resource inadequacies and, and lack of access to resources. And now apparently we're supposed to deal with the entire population, but not have access to the resources ourselves that will allow us to do that. And so we end up tripping over people and we end up tripping into people and we end up standing in photo opportunities and we have to put up with people becoming great because they're riding on the coattails of others rather than focusing on the individuals who need the support right now, maybe in a different way. But again, we have no guide for that. So for demand, the Calgary Food Bank, the demand has changed. And we have to be used to that. And we have to be used that there will also be organizations who do not make it through this. There are organizations that will try and rebrand themselves to say, we did food during COVID, but they didn't. They were trying to make a difference in a new world that they didn't know what their role was. And we also have to help them understand that maybe their time has come. Maybe this is not something that's needed anymore, but how do we take your expertise and move it into that next wave of what Canada and the world will look like? So all these conversations relate back to Unfortunately, public policy and giving our communities access to the resources that are needed and not asking strange questions and for extra grant application material during the time when we need to perform at our best.
And I think that's what we have today is we have the ability to perform at our best and it's a great showcase. But after this is done, I also believe that we need to push for stronger conversations so that we truly can close food banks so that we can address the root causes and have a community that has an equitable well-being that doesn't have to rely on food banks in order to get to the next week. Thank you, Alina. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, James. And uh, you can see why, uh, why James gets called um, upon to speak on food security issues, because I, I don't know of uh, that many shops that advocate for their own uh, demise. So thank you for thank you for that perspective. That's that's great. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Steve. And uh, it's um, it's actually uh, I'm very interested in this because it's it's coming from a uh, community organization that's that's obviously from you can tell from the the name Bridge Street United Church. So I'm very very interested to hear from you on on how the faith sector is is mobilizing and also because uh, Steve and I are working on a coordinated access process our, our teams are, are busy on right now in, in Hastings County. So it's, it's again, to, to Rod's point, it's part of a broader network and, and food security is just one aspect of well-being to, to James's point. So um, over to you, Steve. Thanks, Selena. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Having some issues with that a little bit earlier. Uh, thanks for having me on here. Uh, I'm coming to you from Belleville at the very south end of Hastings County uh, and it's good to join you from a safe distance and not just because we're a couple thousand kilometers from Calgary. Uh, the Belleville is a city of about 50,000 um, close to equidistant between uh, Toronto and Ottawa about 45 minutes west of Kingston uh, if you're familiar with your uh, southeastern Ontario geography. Uh, Bridge Street United Church has uh, been serving meals since the mid 90s uh, and as part of what we do in, in the community um, ecosystem of uh, social supports and uh, providing for those uh, with needs uh, that, that can't be met in other ways. So a little bit about uh, what we do if you want to go to the next slide Alina. Uh, lunch was before COVID-19 um, previously available five days a week in Belleville served by several uh, different organizations. Uh, when COVID-19 came and, and affected everybody's um, operations, that rapidly shifted. And so the availability of uh, lunches, of, of prepared meals during the day, um, and the time of day that those were served uh, changed dramatically in the space of a week. And so some plans to adapt programs were accelerated, some programs uh, needed to close temporarily. And so uh, within that, um, ecosystem of services, Bridge Street United Church was able to rapidly pivot to uh, serving lunches seven days a week, uh, soup sandwich, a um, couple of things to drink and some fresh fruit. Uh, our, our initial impetus for that was to make sure that those with nowhere else to go um, had something to eat. There's many people who have places to live, um, but there is also a, a large number who don't. And where can they go when uh, meals aren't available during the day? And do we have to wait till supper again after having breakfast or can we do something in between? And so uh, we uh, created this lunch program, which was new to us, uh, but we have food service experience. We have a, a newly renovated kitchen in the church in a central location. So it was a good uh, fit for us to provide that service. I want to go over a few things, what worked for us, what worked for us in, in adapting in this situation, and then to look at the broader community as well. So specifically to our lunch program, uh, it was really only possible because of a partnership with the Enrichment Center for Mental Health. And that's not hyperbole. Sometimes we say, I couldn't have done this without you, and it's a little bit of an overstatement, but that's really not the case here. We couldn't do this lunch program with our own capacity because out of about 200 plus volunteers that we have for our um, programs, uh, we had about 20 that are available to us for a variety of very good reasons and important reasons. And we encourage people to stay home. If you're retired and, and need to care for elderly parents, if you're caring for uh, others in your household, 
um, if you yourself are in a dem demographic that is at higher risk, you need to be at home. And so we saw uh, a significant reduction in the volunteers that were available to us initially and had to adapt. And so partnership enabled us to create this uh, novel program. Uh, another enabling factor was the internal commitment to adapt and to continue providing service. We had to um, adjust. It's hard to remember what it was like six or eight weeks ago because things have changed so rapidly and, and we've hit a, a whole different um, plateau, I guess, of uh, where we're at and what we're providing. But when, when we were in a period of rapid change at the uh, early stages of COVID-19, we'd make a plan and then the next day you'd have to make another plan and then you'd have a t a, that plan which was um, needing to be revised again and so uh, the the commitment to adapt and to continue asking how can we keep providing services how can we do this to meet uh, our meal provision outcomes uh, and also to meet the public health requirements and those public health outcomes of uh, not transmitting the disease, thinking through all of the things we touch as a matter of course and food service, uh, the, uh, say food handling training is very helpful in thinking about how to maintain a safe and healthy environment, uh, but we were thinking about it in, in different ways uh, and because of the restrictions. So that commitment to adapt was essential. And lastly, uh, we, as uh, Rod mentioned, um, were able to access emergency funding and the significance there is not uh, the, you know, how much or um, what the difference is from our normal funding, but that we knew the money was available to us to enable that rapid transition. And so we could say yes, because they were, uh, we had funders saying, make sure these meals are available and talk to us about uh, your financial needs. So that were, those were significant um, enabling factors for us in uh, changing rapidly to to this. Back one slide if you could, Alina. Have a few. Thanks. Uh, in terms of meeting the needs in the community, again the partnerships have been spoken about uh, a lot by others. Uh, I want to highlight uh, the ability and willingness to say yes. Again, it's, it's like I said for our organization, the commitment to adapt. Um, the importance of others saying yes we can do that, yes we can adapt our services, yes we can work together in new ways that we haven't before. Yes, we can create programs to address some of the issues uh, that we're hearing at the other end of the phone line as new people call in. That's um, a really important part of the partnerships that we've seen, um, even amidst a very challenging context. We've also uh, had to stay connected, sometimes in new ways, with regular meetings with other food providers in the community, sharing ideas, sharing information, planning collectively so that we can build toward uh, a more a cooperative, but then a um, more coordinated system of addressing a, a breadth of need in the community. Interesting part of staying connected it, in this situation, it really shows the benefits and the drawbacks of informal networks. We're able to rapidly connect with the people we know. I can call whomever at other organizations and we can get things done quickly. But then we saw non-traditional food providers, as James said, you know, some uh, health uh, organizations, for example, that have clients that they're in regular contact with that now have um, food needs coming to the fore and are trying to address those. So the informal networks are great between existing uh, food providers, but to the extent that the other, others who are being forced to ad address food needs aren't part of those informal networks, it also becomes a bit of a challenge uh, to address. So getting together and, and reaching out and drawing people in, uh, widening the circle as we like to say in the United Church, um, has been an important part of how we've adapted in our community. Uh, the generosity of the community in, in kind and monetary contributions has been um, outstanding and we're very grateful for that and we see it uh, across the organizations that I'm aware of. I want to talk about the volunteer paradox because it's part of the generosity that many new people, uh, people who haven't been part of our programs before, people who haven't had the ability to volunteer who now are finding themselves with um, more flexible schedules or a different availability of time are offering to volunteer. But the paradox is that we are paring back the number of people that we can accommodate in our programs to achieve the public health uh, requirements. So we have a skeleton staff in the kitchen and in uh, serving. So we have um, 
many people who want to volunteer, but not uh, enough capacity to accommodate them, which is, uh, I highlight because it's an interesting place to be as a charitable organization. Uh, usually we would love to have volunteers and bring in more volunteers and incorporate them into our regular um, schedules. And this is a way that we together as a community care for each other, that we, we volunteer and, and welcome each other into these uh, roles. And then um, COVID-19 has constrained our ability uh, to do that. One of the interesting and defining, I think, features of, of this uh, unusual time. Next slide, please. So thinking about what's still needed, looking ahead, um, one of the things that we need to do is understand and respond to, to food needs and food insecurity in, in this new usual. We have uh, done a fairly good job um, across organizations in Belleville that provide food uh, in meeting the needs that we know and in, in meeting the needs in the ways that we uh, usually do. We've continued to provide meals, the Salvation Army is providing meals, the food bank is providing hampers. We're seeing uh, different clients and increasing clients definitely um, in some cases, in new clients that is. Uh, but what are the needs that we don't know? And that's been a bit of a challenge for us, finding ways to connect with people that don't usually uh, need the kind of assistance that we provide, those who are newly vulnerable. And James alluded to that as well. You see a 19% increase in new clients at the Calgary Food Bank. There are a number of people who don't have experience with needing these kinds of supports. And so uh, we're rapidly having to, to try to reach out and find ways for those individuals to reach out to us and us to be understanding and then responding uh, to those needs. And of course, the need for food is often associated with other needs as well. So it's not just about what do you need in terms of food? How do we get groceries to your front door? But what else uh, might you have requirement for? And, and where are those networks in place? So I think COVID-19 has it, um, illustrated the need for that coordinated response that transcends one system. It's not just about housing. It's not just about food. It's about all of these things together. And Rod, you mentioned early on the interconnectedness between services and between needs. And uh, certainly that's been placed into sharp relief uh, in a pandemic. As we look ahead, uh, we, are, we are among food providers starting to talk about the sustainability and the transition planning. Our lunch program and the partnerships that enabled it uh, are built on uh, inputs that aren't sustainable. We have staff who are retasked to um, jobs that they uh, are going to have to leave to go back to their regular work. Um, we have uh, volunteers who are putting in multiple shifts a week that won't be able to do that after COVID-19. So as we think about um, reopening uh, our provinces, as, as it's being called, as we look to the wind down of the social isolation and the physical distancing, we have to be thinking about how we transform our programs in a way that ensures continuity, because the need's not going to go away um, at the same rate uh, as we are going to have to transition into more sustainable models. And so making sure that there's continuity and that that transition is orderly, that we're not in panic mode as we have to do that is uh, an important part of what we're thinking about together right now. And then um, addressing food security in the new usual, meeting evolving food needs requires us to remain uh, adaptable and agile as organizations and as a system to move toward a, intentionally toward uh, system response um, because uh, we're talking as food providers, the reality of need um, post 2008 economic uh, recession really only became uh, most visible in the long term. 18 to 24 months afterward, we are seeing the what the new um, usual for us looked like. So adapting our needs, understanding what the dynamics of food security and food insecurity are in our communities right now, but then um, continuing to see how they change and adapt into uh, whatever settles out as a, as a new usual. And then of course, um, your friendly reminder that uh, food insecurity is an income problem, not a food problem. Um, this pandemic 
brings that into relief as well. I'm really looking forward to seeing the analysis of charitable food program use um, compared to uh, the emergency benefits that were rolled out. Uh, there's some reason to think that with the money coming uh, from various sources, from exceptional benefits um, or extraordinary benefits rather, uh, that, that the need for charitable food programs is impacted in some way, pos possibly, how do I say that? That the need might be reduced because incomes um, are being supplemented in ways that they aren't usually. It's a great experiment to show, to prove what we already know about food security, that it's very sensitive to income and that income is the necessary response. So how are we as a community, and then of course this transcends the community level, but uh, to build on what James is saying, as a matter of public policy, are we going to learn the lesson here that in order to properly address food insecurity, we need to be addressing it um, as an income issue and uh, take the necessary steps to reduce food insecurity over the long term based on what we have learned again in this uh, short term. Thanks. That's it for me. Awesome. Thank you. That was great. Um, before we turn over to the questions as well, and I know uh, Jenny is uh, busy looking at uh, and synthesizing for us so we can get through some of these quickly. Um, as you likely are very well aware, um, even globally around um, domestic funds as well. So um, working with our partners in Manitoba and Alberta, we're going to bring together the next webinar on May 19th and focusing on domestic violence and, uh, and COVID responses, particularly in recovery. So if, if that's something of interest to you, just a, a note before some of you sign off to mark your calendars and 11 a.m. up with that as well. Um, so thank you for all of the presenters. We uh, committed to sticking around, uh, um, or at least most of us, till 1030 if to answer your questions. If you can't stay and you need to sign off, by all means, you can drop your question in the Q&A and we'll, we'll respond to it and you can uh, take a look at it in the recording as well afterwards. But if you can't stick around, um, we'll we're going to do our best to make our way through them as quickly and efficiently as possible. So, Jenny, do you want to uh, give us a sense of what uh, what folks are wanting to know more about? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, the first question we had from Franco Savoya was directed at Rod. Um, can everyone hear me? By the way, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Rod, are there other service? Are there yeah. other providers independent of you providing food in Abbotsford, and what is your relationship to them? Uh, yes, absolutely. So I alluded to some of the other groups who uh, provide different uh, meals, uh, Salvation Army, um, and then there's also a Cyrus Center that would provide different meals that are more youth specific, um, as well as Mennonite Central Committee. There's also um, some new groups that are doing some incubation type of initiatives. Uh, there's a group called the Rail District uh, that's setting up some new space to test out uh, possibly some, some new ideas or, that we as a community can look at. Um, new idea to just to, to see what we can as a community uh, explore around some possible uh, ways to look at uh, a collective approach to doing food, food security. So yes, numerous, numerous in approaches. Great. Okay, uh, we have a question here from Dickie DeCamba. Um, uh, Dickie DeCamba is the executive director of Canavua. Uh, Canavua offers a food bank service for francophones in Edmonton. Wanting to learn good practices from you, how do you distribute specific foods for a population whose eating habits are based on eating fresh? So any, anyone, any one of our panelists, would you, it's not really directed at any one particular panelist, but if anybody wants to join in, please feel free. If I may offer a comment. 
Absolutely. Um, eating fresh, uh, I think, comes into a line of a lot of the conversations around what do we eat um, and how do we eat it. So whether we look at we're eating fresh, uh, the 100 mile diet from several years ago, uh, we could look at uh, eating halal or kosher or vegan, vegetarian, uh, Crohn's. There are so many different personal discussions about what we see as food. Um, I, I think it's, a, it's an engagement at your community level to say, what are the things that you would like to see um, when, you're, when you are forced, unfortunately, into a position of needing emergency food? Um, we can talk about fresh, but as Rod commented, and I believe Steve commented as well, if a food bank or a pantry or a community organization doesn't have a fridge, there's not going to be a lot of opportunity. And, and food safety kind of trumps all of this. You, you can't just hand somebody something and say, yeah, it's been sitting in my trunk for a couple hours, but don't worry, you'll be fine. So I, I think within this week, it's a larger conversation. And I would encourage people to eat fresh. I, I think the nutrients are greater. But that will not take away from the fact that frozen foods, uh, thinking vegetables and fruits and that, maintain their nutrient content much better now than they ever did. So fresh could also be frozen. And I think we have to be open to those conversations as well. Great. Um, perfect. So uh, the next question we had. Um was directed at you, James. Uh, James, is there an opportunity for the food bank to positively support those uh, pop-up food banks that you referred to earlier in your, um, in your presentation? I certainly, I, I would encourage it actually. Um, one of the things that we see is that there are people in the community have a great voice into terms of what's needed in their community, especially when you're looking at the large cities. Um, you're, it, you can't look at it as this big million people thing. You, you have to know what's inside your community, who your neighbors are. That being said, however, as we pointed out in the, in the group today, it doesn't help when people or organizations become pop-ups, but they don't wish to work in cooperation with others already working in the space. So the sector has enough challenges as it stands about duplication of services and the emotional uh, rather than the, the need being defined, it becomes an emotional conversation. So you end up with clusters of organizations that really do, they do good work, but there's 30 of them in one area and where those organizations could really work is in about 14 areas that are outside. So we're not having a conversation, we're only going to the places that are sexy, we're not going to the places that perhaps actually need those services. And when pop-ups happen, if the pop-up is unwilling to engage with others, that creates an isolationist attitude that is very difficult to overcome because the response will be emotional. Somebody will hold up something and say, well, this, this child is gonna die unless we, ha we gave them food. And we're like, yeah, but you're the sixth of eight that are all now popped up in what, we thought, what you think is a high needs area. So there's gotta be a better conversation to this one as well. Great. Okay. Uh, Rick Could Wall? I chime oh. in on that one? Yes, absolutely. Sorry. I think uh, from a data perspective too, it's interesting when you have um, new providers that are short term come in because when we're assessing need as a community, we're saying, well, this is what I'm seeing at my place. This is what I'm seeing at my place. Uh, and we're sharing that information. When you have a whole bunch of new players that aren't sharing that information in the same way, either because they're, um, doing something completely new to them that they're going to be uh, finishing, you know, when this, um, when we move to a different context or, uh, you know, the, the willingness to uh, play in the sandbox well or whatever it is, when you have um, an influx of services available, uh, but that data isn't being shared, it becomes increasingly difficult to understand what the need is and how to respond as established organizations. So uh, th it's great that food is available and food is, um, food needs are being met, uh, but it does create some challenges too that we need to be able to address uh, together. Wonderful. There was a kind of a related uh, comment that came through that said, I understand that a very large portion, a proportion of good pro produce in the world is wasted. Perhaps there is an opportunity to reduce waste earlier in the supply chain before spoilage occurs. Maybe this could improve provision of fresh food items to food banks. Uh, any, any kind of 
feedback on that? Uh, just because I can and not because I should. Um, I would encourage anyone who's looking at food waste to think about what they define as food waste, um, but also look at the existing research on where food is being quote unquote wasted. Um, there, there's a misconception often that someplace in the supply chain is this massive amount of food that's being wasted when what the data shows is that there's a massive amount of food waste uh, potentially at the producer level, and we're seeing that certainly with supply chains being gummed up right now, um, where hogs can't get to market, where farms are at risk because they can't get um, staff in order to get the crops in or get the crops out. Uh, we can't do harvesting appropriately. And then the other end of the spectrum is actually the kitchen table. And so when we're looking at these two pieces, if you go to a restaurant, you want to choose the food you want, but the restaurant doesn't know you're coming. So they have to plan for any eventuality. Right now, most restaurants, they will feed their staff, they will feed others, they will share that food already. So the definition of waste, I think, has to be a little bit more finessed in terms of understanding what people actually want by waste. Because right now, the two locations for waste are not really locations where you can harvest things from effectively. Um, I, I can take my leftovers and give them to you if you'd like, but is that a dignified way of doing it? If you would need it, why would you give it to somebody else and say, oh, I know you're in need, but you just have to accept this because it's waste to me, but you have to take it because of you're vulnerable. And, and those people that are often quoted in this, that's, that's not a, a way to do this. That just has to stop. But absolutely, there is, uh, in terms of your original question, there's a group that people can look up called Fraser Valley Gleaners that uh, was developed here in our community that uh, took a lot of culled vegetables uh, because of the location where we're at here. Um, and they, they have hundreds of volunteers. They dry uh, they cut and dry all of those vegetables and rather than all of it ending up in the landfill, which is where it was previously going, uh, it is now made into uh, soup stock. And that soup stock ends up going to uh, places locally and then to other countries all over the world and is used in that way. And it was an innovative group that didn't want to have all of that uh, usable food go to waste. So there are, there are things that we can do. I would point out to Rod that that's a fabulous response. Um, that's now become part of a different supply chain. You know, a supply chain to uh, food banks, meal programs. I mean, uh, we were seeing uh, an excess in supply of milk right now. Um, so we're getting lots of extra milk, which is great, uh, but we just can't move it fast enough. And so the pressures on supply chains become pressures on charitable organizations. If we can address food waste by creating an alternative supply chain or, um, you know, it's a, really it's an institutionalized response to uh, an excess um, in the, the food supply, the regular food supply chain, that that's fabulous. In terms of public policy, um, there's plenty of research coming out of proof. Uh, the research outfitted from the University of Toronto, uh, the stop in uh, Toronto as well, uh, of food waste and what can be done with excess food that from the food um, supply chain, uh, but that also food waste in itself is not an adequate solution to food insecurity because food insecurity is an income problem. And I'm gonna be a broken record if I continue on this path, but, um, I think it, it bears repeating that we need to be reframing how we see ourselves. And, and so thinking about how do we work on closing the Calgary Food Bank or stopping serving meals out of Bridge Street United Church in Belleville is an important part of how we consider short-term responses, but especially the long-term, um, what needs to be done at a policy level to really impact food insecurity in Canada. Great. Okay. Thanks, everyone. So, uh, Jenny, we have a, a question from um, Dicky Dikamba. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to unmute him. So, I, you're I believe you're on now. Um, can lower it and yeah. Can you hear uh, me? Yeah. Go for it. Ah, okay. Hi, my name is Dicky Dikamba. I'm running the Francophone Food Bank here in Edmonton. So. 
just a uh, uh, comment about uh, uh, when I'm talking about uh, uh, eating fresh. So um, we have a lot of clients uh, from uh, 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 French speaking. So they are almost newcomers here in Canada. And uh, uh, they are not familiar with like uh, food in cans, something like that. So when I'm talking about uh, uh, eating fresh, it's like uh, there is any uh, food bank around uh, Canada who was working with a uh, farmer like that. If you, you know some, uh, um, uh, some of them, I would like to uh, have a discussion with them uh, to, to know how they, they work with farmer to get like uh, uh, fresh food, something like that. So I would like to have uh, a discussion with uh, this kind of uh, partner. So if they have an uh, in independent provider like farmer, so it would be great for us to learn uh, from them. Yeah. Okay. Any any takers on that or any further remarks? Thank you, Dickie. Okay. Thank you. So, Dickie, we do uh, access fresh food from the various uh, farms over the summer, mm -hmm. and yeah, we have. We have through our partnerships with uh, local farms uh, access to fresh foods, fresh produce over the summer period. Okay, that's great. Great. Okay. 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 Thanks. Thanks very much. And um, there was just a comment that came in as well that was kind of related. It says on. Um, even in smaller communities like Revelstoke, BC, we have a very active food recovery program and are distributing perfectly fresh food every day. Over the past three years, we have saved over 300,000 pounds of perfectly edible food from the landfill. This is not a solution to ending poverty, but it is definitely getting food to people who need it. That's from Patty Larson. Thank you, Patty, for that. Um, okay, so two, uh, two related questions that came in. Um, Carrie from Red Deer uh, said, some of the feedback I've gotten is that some people are reluctant to fill out applications for food bank hampers as they feel rather it's rather intrusive, referring to proof of need of related, uh, related to income. Has this been problematic in other communities? And the second question is, can you each touch on how your respective food banks treat their guests with dignity and respect? Would you like me to read the questions out again? Yeah, any, any thoughts about that? That's, uh, that's certainly, I've heard that before too about the um, kind of the means testing issue for food banks. Um, yeah, any, any comments on, on our, our opinions on that hot button issue? I'll take it on if no one else wants to start. Uh, food, ba food banks, and there's another question in the chain here that I'll sort of tie into this. Um, food banks as organizations are truly grassroots. So they, they have tended to pop up, um, and, and most food programs, they, they tend to pop up from within the community. So whether it's a faith-based community coming together to help people, whether it's just a community activity, a community action society or something like that, they, they've really popped up grassroots and they've gone from there. So there is no effective sort of federated, which is what Canada's kind of used to. We've got this structure of federal, provincial, municipal, regional structure that's in place. But most food programs don't have that responsibility. So they're not required. Uh, Habitat for Humanity has Habitat for Humanity. Canada, they have Habitat. Calgary, that, there's a very federated structure in that. What that has, has brought into it is that every food bank kind of treats its community as its community has guided them. So when you're in a community years and years, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, which is, tends to be where food banks sort of popped up again, because it's not net new. Um, a lot of communities went one direction, others went another direction. Uh, using the big cities as examples, uh, Vancouver used to have a member model where you would be a member of the Greater Vancouver Food Bank. Um, there are food banks in Canada that actually, some of the big ones don't actually do direct to client service. They just share food resources with other smaller food banks within their community, thinking more of the Ottawa or the daily bread type of situation. 
So when we get to smaller food banks that are in the community, it truly is community owned, operated and driven. So where food banks have developed some form of means test, it's actually been as a response to, we have a limited supply of food, we have limited resources, we had to try and figure out some way that we could marshal the resources effectively and equitably to a, a population, a, a group of people who needed food, but weren't otherwise engaged in their community. So the, the corning were over the fence wasn't working necessarily. So there are food banks that look and go, yeah, here's the food, have at it, go for it. Um, we know in Calgary, if somebody uh, calls in and says, I don't have any idea, I have nothing, we're like, yeah, okay, whatever, here's the food. But how can we then help you get the ID that you need or get the connections you need to the root causes that has been become manifested in food? Um, so a lot of food banks will put an income piece in there just to get somebody talking. It doesn't mean that they actually adhere to it. But there are, there are food banks um, that will only do that. And they ask for SIN, they ask for uh, bills, they ask for your income tax and all that other kind of stuff. And there, there's often a question like, how did that develop? Why did you develop that? And from a, a dignity and respect question, um, I would ask, what is dignity? What is respect? Um, it's, it's a very loaded terminology. Um, and there is a belief that there shouldn't be any questions at all. But at that point then, how do you marshal resources to those who need them rather than those who want them? And, and we're certainly seeing this in COVID right now where I know there's one city where a leader in that city said, if you have money, grocery stores deliver. Because what they were experiencing was people saying self-isolation makes me vulnerable so I should access the food bank. But you've got money. Why are you not just getting the food delivered to you through the existing structure? So that would be my comments. I'm, I'm gonna just um, move us along just because I know folks have to sign off, uh, but I think this is a really, really important one and uh, maybe we'll, this will be the, the last one we take. Sorry, Ian and Jonathan, just uh, um, maybe we, the presenters can take a stab at those and, and say, with the video, but this one's from Karen. I think it's a really good one. Um, how are we responding to support food security on risk? I think, uh, Lena, you just cut out there. So I think you're, the question that you're asking is how are their communities supporting food security on reserves? Yes. Yeah. Panels, would you like to go ahead and answer? Jump in. Um, I've uh, done connection with um, just phone calls with uh, the chiefs and just asked in terms of how things are going and uh, found out uh, personally just, just to see how things are going and then based on that um, found out that things are, are in control, in, in process. Uh, so yeah. It, it was a matter of, of direct direct asking. Yeah, for us, we're serving um, meals out of our location, and so we're not providing services uh, outside of our community or really outside of our block, um, relying on people to come to us. And so uh, the question doesn't have a, a, a direct connection to us, I suppose, but as far as our community response goes, uh, we have contacts on um, the territory that's bordering Belleville uh, and are actively involving uh, some of the organizations there providing for food needs on uh, the territory um, so that we're, we're keeping each other informed and learning uh, from each other and making sure that uh, the, the supports we can provide to each other um, are available. In Calgary, we developed a formula years ago where we looked at the nations in the province of Alberta because Calgary also works provincially and, and nationally at some points. Um, and we approached it from perspective that every nation is autonomous. So we, we used roughly a, a population density calculation and said, how many people are living in what part of the province? We used the nations, we used the Métis regions. 
And then because we know that poverty and, and a lot of the issues around it um, are, are not um, standard community pieces, they're not gonna be the same. They're, they're double, triple, quadruple or more. What we did in our sharing formulas from Calgary is we actually doubled and tripled up based on the municipality. So that if you've got 100 units of food, for example, and 38% of the population lives in Calgary, if that's what we start with, then we also look at whatever else is going on into the community. So that's available to the different nations through a food sharing model. Um, we understand that actually, I think there has to be a louder voice in this case, accountable to the government of Canada. Um, that this is very much, the government of Canada has repeatedly announced that they're going to do something about the situation in the nations of Canada, and they've continued to fail to do so, choosing rather to dump it onto not-for-profit organizations and abdicate their responsibility um, based on some colonial attitude. Uh, there's only so much we can do, but I think part of this also has to be not only the sharing of food, but it also has to be a voice to say, you've screwed it up, folks, could you please fix this and actually engage in this? It's still unacceptable that you can't drink the water in parts of Canada, um, but it tends to be in, in, the, in nations rather than in a small city that, or a small town or a hamlet or something like that. Sorry. Thank you. And I, I think we only have one question left. Um, and it's, and I think let's, okay, this for real will be the last one. And this will be like our really quick um, two cents on how we're tracking need. Um, obviously through, uh, I mentioned some data that we're tracking. So Help Seeker tracks interactions with resources. So we can see in different regions what people are searching for assistance with, but that's just part of the, the data kind of curation that we should be doing to understand social needs during COVID. So um, James, you presented some data. Do you, wanna, do you wanna take this one and let us know your thoughts on how we should be tracking food insecurity uh, during COVID? Uh, I, I think people should actually just track data. I, I find uh, oftentimes we make decisions based on gut instinct and, the, and they're fairly accurate. But when it comes to actually conveying the impact that something happens, the question that I think we need to answer is what happened as a result of this food? More food is not better. More clients are not better. I think we need to really focus our data gathering around the what happened as a result of this food. And it is not a question of what is your income. It has to be a question of did that person come back? Did that community come back? Did that agency deliver their programs effectively? And I think that data has to be shared more widely. There is not a good data set in Canada around food security. Um, and I think that has to be changed. Awesome. So we, we're getting more, more to do as a result of this, which, uh, you know, we, we always appreciate. <laughs> but um, thank you. Thank you to all of you, Rod, James, and Steve. This is been excellent and uh, your perspective on the ground is uh, is what matters the most so um, you know hopefully that we had a, a chance to hear from three folks that are leading the charge in this area and I know from the comments that we had your peers from across the country that are similarly uh, challenged by the, the COVID situation and how uh, the food security piece is across the country. So I think this is just another piece of that greater puzzle around advocacy that we all need to be uh, pushing forward. So, so thank you for sharing um, your thoughts on this and taking the time out of your really, really busy schedules and um, joining us this morning. So uh, a reminder to everyone, we're going to share all of the materials and, uh, um, you know, I was going to say connect with folks directly if you want more information, but I'm also aware that they're uber busy. So what we can commit to is, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll curate your, um, the materials and we'll send it out to you. And if there's additional details in future web Webinars that you'd like to see, please let us know. Uh, Jenny at HelpSecure.org is our um, community engagement person on this. So we're, we're going to try to crowdsource as much as possible so that we're not all kind of running around and um, just getting in each other's way, given the, the kind of urgency in, in front of us. So thank you so much and hope to see some of you at the domestic violence um, and COVID recovery response in May. 
And yeah, please uh, keep ideas coming and we'll do our best to respond. So thank you again to all of you for today. Appreciate it. And uh, yeah, be well, stay healthy and uh, yeah, see you next time.